For some couples, a meagre date night or a weekend away somewhere quiet just doesn't quite fuel their passion, and they must turn to much more sinister means of adding excitement and joy to their relationship. Although it's a horrifying thought to many of us that the death of an innocent bystander could be an integral part of another's relationship, to those twisted certain couples, it provides intimacy and a bond that they could not otherwise obtain. Here are three cases of terrifying killer couples. Gwendolyn Graham and Kathy Wood Gwendolyn Graham was born August 6, 1963, and lived for a period of time in Texas, before she moved to Walker, Michigan at the age of 24, and began working as a nurse's aide in the Alpine Manor Nursing Home, a 200-bed facility. It was here that Gwendolyn met Kathy Wood, a recently divorced 25-year-old, born March 7, 1962, and who'd been working at the home for a year. Although Gwendolyn had always maintained an interest in female lovers, Kathy had been married to a man for most of her life, and the relationship that they struck up shortly after meeting blossomed quickly, the experience entirely new for Kathy. Later dubbed the Lethal Lovers, Gwendolyn and Kathy entered a romantic relationship in 1986. The following year, their relationship took a brutal and twisted turn. Which of the two women truly did the killing is somewhat unknown, as both pinned the blame on each other when they were ultimately apprehended in 1988. What we do know is that Kathy turned on Gwendolyn not long after being questioned by authorities. She entered into a plea bargain, which gave her a lesser sentence in exchange for her testimony against her former lover and co-worker. According to Kathy, Gwendolyn had murdered five elderly patients as part of a love bond. Each thought the shared secret would keep the other from leaving. Gwendolyn would smother the women with a washcloth, the patients primarily Alzheimer's sufferers, and Kathy would act as a lookout, keeping watch and distracting other nurses to make sure they didn't uncover the crimes. As the death of the patients appeared to be natural, none of the other workers in the home felt there was any reason to be alarmed or suspicious, and no autopsies were ever performed on the bodies. Kathy claimed that Gwendolyn killed to relieve her tension. Over the next several months after their first killing, four more women were murdered. Each was incapacitated by their struggle with Alzheimer's disease. Allegedly, Gwendolyn had attempted to murder five other women before she started targeting the mentally ill patients, but they would often fight back, and so she had to choose other victims. Oddly, no patients ever reported the nurse for misconduct or attempted murder, and both she and Kathy were well liked by the patients in their charge. Worse still, the women were hailed for their exemplary records and skill at their jobs. Reportedly, when the couple initially started picking out victims, they tried to spell out the word murder with the initials of the targets, but this became too difficult, so the game changed. They decided each murder would count as a day, after the saying, I love you for forever and a day. A poem by Kathy to Gwendolyn finished with the line, you'll be mine for forever and five days. According to Kathy, her partner also took souvenirs from their victims and kept them on a shelf in her home, but sources differ on whether this was true or not. Some say police never found these trophies, whilst other reports claim that Gwendolyn made sick jokes about murdering women and keeping a shelf of souvenirs in her home and that several other colleagues testified to this during her trial. Eventually, Kathy and Gwendolyn split up, Gwendolyn began dating another woman at the nursing home, and the pair moved back to Texas, where they began working in a hospital taking care of babies. At some point, Kathy told her ex-husband about the murders, and although it took him 14 months to come forward, the ex went to the police with the information. An investigation was launched in 1988, and Walker Police interviewed Kathy, who admitted to the killings, but painted Gwendolyn as the true mastermind. Two of the bodies which had not been cremated were exhumed, but an autopsy didn't show any signs of foul play, a frequent occurrence in smothering cases. Despite this, the county medical examiner ruled the deaths as a homicide, 
and police issued a warrant for the arrest of the two women. Between December the 4th and 5th, 1988, the women were brought into custody and charged with the two murders, which is where Kathy managed to bag herself a plea bargain. Although there was a lack of physical evidence, Gwendolyn was eventually found guilty with the help of her current girlfriend who testified that Gwendolyn told her about the murders. On November the 3rd, 1989, Gwendolyn was found guilty of five counts of murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. She was sentenced to five life sentences. Kathy was charged with one count of second degree murder and conspiracy to commit second degree murder. She was reportedly released on probation in 2018. Kathy made Gwendolyn out to be sexually, physically and emotionally dominant in the relationship, but many question the validity of these claims. Friends, family and certain co-workers claim that Kathy was a coercive and seductive pathological liar who enjoyed wreaking havoc in the lives of others. A book on the murders named Forever and Five Days presents evidence that Kathy planned the first murder after she found her lover with another woman and that she involved Gwendolyn to keep her from leaving her. Reportedly, a psychological assessment done on Gwendolyn showed that she was susceptible to manipulation and suffered borderline personality disorder. She also lacked the know-how to plan the murders. The book goes on to say that Kathy allegedly told inmates in prison of two different versions of the crimes. The first is that the whole thing was made up and she was exacting revenge on Gwendolyn for leaving her, whilst the second version is that she, Kathy, carried out the murders and framed her ex-significant other. Regardless of who really did the killing, the lives of five vulnerable elderly women were taken during the pair's six spree. Marguerite Chambers, 60, Edith Cole, 89, Myrtle Luce, 95, May Mason, 70, and Belle Burkhard, 74. All fell victim to the lethal lovers. James Clifford Carson and Susan Carson Prior to 1977, James Clifford Carson appeared to be a hard-working family man living in Phoenix, Arizona. 1977 saw his wife notice odd changes in his behaviour, which made her fear for her own safety and that of their five-year-old daughter, so she decided to leave her long-term husband. Whilst it's unknown what triggered these changes, or what exactly these changes were, it's apparent that Carson had no interest in chasing his ex-wife or daughter and reconciling with them. Instead, he began a relationship with another woman, Susan Barnes, who was divorced with two teenage sons. They quickly married and shared an interest in illicit drugs and mysticism, where they believed in union with a higher power and attainment of its knowledge was possible through deep reflection and self-surrender. Carson then changed his name to Michael Bear Carson whilst his wife changed hers to Susan Bear Carson. In a letter Carson wrote to his daughter, he told her that God had given him his new name. By 1980, after a year-long trip to Europe, the Carsons returned home to the United States, where they moved to the San Francisco area. They continued to pursue their interest in the counterculture and partook in drug use. It was around this time when Michael's ex-wife became concerned that he may abduct or harm their daughter, and she took extreme steps to hide from him, including cutting off contact with mutual acquaintances and moving around frequently. In March of 1981, a young aspiring actress from Georgia was found dead in the apartment she'd shared with the Carsons. Her name was Kerrin Barnes, no relation to Susan, and she was just 22 years old. Her end had been an extremely violent one. She'd been stabbed 13 times, had her skull crushed, and had been wrapped in a blanket and hidden in the basement. Certain evidence suggested to authorities that she'd been murdered by someone that she knew, and so the Carsons became law enforcement's prime suspects. Unbeknownst to police initially, the Carsons had already fled. They'd gone to a mountain hideout near Grants Pass in Oregon, where they stayed out of sight until spring of 1982. From here, the couple moved to Alder Point, California, where they lived and worked on a marijuana farm. According to other workers, the pair claimed to be anarchists who advocated revolution and had predicted that a nuclear apocalypse was coming. However, if the Carsons had been attempting to lie low during their time on the farm, then it didn't last long. In May that same year, Michael shot and killed a man named Clark Stevens, 
a colleague whom he'd had a dispute with. The Carsons attempted to destroy the body by burning it and then burying it under chicken fertilizer in the woods. Just two weeks later, Stevens was reported missing and his remains were uncovered. Predictably, the Carsons, considered suspects yet again, fled from the farm. Police found a manifesto in amongst their belongings, which called for, amongst other things, the assassination of then-President Ronald Reagan. Six months later in November 1982, Michael was picked up by police in LA after an acquaintance spotted him hitchhiking, but due to police error, he was freed before he could be interrogated. Evidence left behind by the criminal included a mugshot, a dress, and a gun left in the police car. It's unknown if this was later tied to the Clark Stevens murder. In January of 1983, the Carsons were hitchhiking and were offered a lift by 30-year-old John Charles Hellyar. Susan then decided that John was a witch and had to be killed. This was Susan's motive behind the other murders too. Whilst driving along Route 101 in Sonoma County, an argument in the vehicle broke out and John pulled over. The fight began escalating quickly before Susan stabbed John as he and Michael struggled over a gun. Eventually Michael got control of the weapon and killed the 30-year-old in front of passing motorists, one of whom phoned emergency services. Whilst the couple did attempt to flee in John's car, they were soon apprehended. At first the Carsons demanded a press conference so they could publicly confess. They were obviously looking for the spotlight and enjoyed the spectacle being made over the murders. However, the pair then recanted their confessions and pled not guilty. This didn't sway the jury, who convicted the couple of Kerrin Barnes's murder on June 12, 1984. They were sentenced to 25 years each, before being charged with the other two murders of Clark Stevens and John Charles Hellyer, where they then received 75 years to life. During a five-hour interview with KGO TV, the San Francisco Chronicle and Homicide Investigators, the Carsons claimed to be pacifists and vegetarian yoga practitioners who'd converted to Islam. Their crimes were a result of their shared mission to exterminate so-called witches. This claim later led to them being dubbed the San Francisco Witch Killers by the media. The pair tried to justify their horrifying acts of violence by claiming that Karen Barnes had falsely converted to their religion, whilst both Clark and John had attempted to sexually assault Susan. The Carsons also claimed that a higher power called on them to kill their enemies for the sake of the country's future. Whilst the Carsons remain suspects in a dozen other American and European murder cases, there's a lack of evidence which prevents further justice being carried out. Susan is eligible for parole in 2030. Michael's daughter Jen, now a grown woman in her 40s, says she once went to visit her father in prison and described him as pure evil. Ray and Faye Copeland Ray Copeland was born on December 30th, 1914 in Oklahoma and had somewhat of a tough start in life. His family moved around often and they struggled through the Great Depression of the 1930s. As a young man, he began to dabble in petty crime, often caught for stealing livestock and forging checks, which eventually led him to spend a year in jail. Upon his release in 1940, he met Faye Della Wilson, who was seven years his junior, and they quickly married and began to have children. They moved around frequently, as money was tight and Ray was a known convicted criminal. He spent further time in jail over the next several years, before engineering a scheme that would make his illegal money-making plot fly under the radar of law enforcement and those he dealt with. Since Ray was a known fraudster, he couldn't buy or sell his own cattle, so he began to pick up drifters and homeless men, employing them as farmhands. The men would buy cattle with his bad checks, and Ray would sell on the animals quickly whilst his employees disappeared. The scam worked for a short time, but eventually, Ray was caught and sent to prison again. When he was released, Ray continued with his scheme, but kept a distance between himself and employees. His ploy continued until a former worker of his, Jack McCormick, called Crime Stoppers in 1989, where he told them that he'd seen human bones on the farm whilst he had worked for the Copelands. He also claimed that Ray had tried to kill him. At first, police were sceptical, but after checking out Ray's criminal record, they decided to investigate. 
law enforcement headed to the Copeland's farm with a search warrant and dozens of officers and bloodhounds. They found the bodies of three young men on the farm and then, on another property owned by the family, they uncovered more remains. All five victims had been shot with a 22 calibre Marlin rifle, which was later discovered in the Copeland's home. Also found in the house was a register of employees, which helped police identify the victims. Twelve of them were marked with an X next to them, in Faye Copeland's handwriting. Authorities also came across a quilt Faye had made out of the victim's clothing. Her actions were questioned, and in 1990, she was put on trial. Faye's defence said she was a dutiful wife and mother who'd endured violence, abuse and ill-treatment at the hands of Ray. She is suspected by some to be a sufferer of battered women's syndrome, where she would unquestionably comply with the demands and requests of her husband. Even her court-provided psychologist advocated for her innocence. However, none of this was enough to convince a jury, who found her guilty on four counts of murder and one count of manslaughter, she was given a death sentence. Faye continued to maintain that she knew nothing of the murders and refused a plea deal for conspiracy to commit murder in exchange for information about the remaining missing men. Her lawyers later appealed her conviction and whilst the death penalty was removed, her charges still stood. In March of 1991, Ray was convicted of five counts of murder and sentenced to death. He had tried to plead not guilty by reason of insanity then strike up a plea deal, but he was refused. After his sentencing, he did not ask about his wife, and his response to her also receiving the death penalty was emotionless and cold. Ray Copeland died of natural causes in October 1993, aged 79. On the 10th of August 2002, Faye suffered a stroke, which left her partially paralysed and unable to speak. The following month, Governor Bob Holden granted her request of not dying inside prison and put her into a nursing home in Chili Coffee, her hometown, where she died five days before Christmas in 2003, aged 83. The couple left behind five children and 17 grandchildren. Although it's uncertain whether Faye really did have a hand in the slaying of her husband's employees, what is for sure is the brutal murders cut short the lives of five young men. Dennis Murphy, 27, Wayne Warner, 27, Jimmy Harvey, 27, John Freeman, 27, and Paul Cowart, 21. So that's three terrifying cases of killer couples. Stay safe, and we'll see you in the next one.